Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the Lost Islamic History podcast. This is our fourth podcast so far. The listener response has been really positive, which we're really happy to hear. Our goal here is to educate and teach you what you missed out probably in your history class. Any feedback that you have is welcome, so please keep it coming. We're going to pick up with part four of the Crusades. Now, in parts one through three of this series, we discuss the Crusader march to Jerusalem, their capture and massacre of the city. We also discuss the lack of a real Muslim response to this invasion. In a disunited Muslim world where every city ruled itself, there was no united Muslim response. Individual emirs focused more on petty wars among themselves than doing anything about the crusader menace. In this episode, we're going to look at how the tide finally turns and the Muslims begin to push back the crusaders. We're going to look at the leadership of a man by the name of Ahmed ad-Din Zengi. We're going to look at the rivalry and unity between Egypt and Syria. And we're going to talk about a very famous and important Muslim general. Most people already know about him, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. So let's talk about how this tide finally begins to turn. A quick review of the political situation of the Muslim world in the early 1100s. The Caliphate in Baghdad was entirely powerless at this point. The Caliph himself had no power outside of his palace. They are a geopolitically insignificant group. In Egypt, you've got a rival caliphate led by the Fatimids, an extremist group of Shias. By the 1100s, they were very weak and unable to do much. Throughout modern Iraq and Syria, you had numerous emirs, each one of which controlled just one city. Once great cities like Damascus, Mosul, and Aleppo were all independent of each other and constantly at war. It was in this Muslim world that the four crusader states were established. They were able to exploit Muslim divisions to their advantage as they established their control over the coast of the Mediterranean. What the Muslim world needed was a strong and powerful leader that could begin to reunite the area in the face of the crusader threat. That leader was a man called Ahmed ad-Din Zengi. He was the governor of a Syrian city called Aleppo, and he t- carried the title of Adabeg, which was a Turkic word roughly meaning leader or prince. His father was killed early in his life, so Ahmed ad-Din was raised by the Adabeg of Mosul, Kerboga. When Kerboga died in 1127, Ahmed ad-Din now became the leader of both Aleppo and Mosul. This was the first time in decades that two cities were actually united under just one leader. He was able to maintain unity through his strict style of leadership. Some chroniclers of the time called him cruel and ruthless. Others referred to him as the strong leader that the Muslim world needed at this time. He instilled fear in both his enemies and the soldiers that served under him. It was said that when marching, his soldiers would actually walk as if they were between two ropes on either side of them, because Ahmed ad-Din threatened to severely punish any soldier that was caught marching on the farmland that they passed through. Now we've got two cities, Aleppo and Mosul, that are united and no longer at war. This is a good start. But if Ahmad ad-Din is going to do anything about the Crusaders, he's going to need a lot more than just two united cities. The opportunity came when the leader of Damascus died in 1128. This caused a little bit of a power vacuum in the city. Ahmad ad-Din tried a few times to bring the city under his control, but each time the citizens and their leaders rose up to resist his attempts at creating an empire in Syria. In any case, Zengi began his attacks on the Crusaders in 1144. He targeted the county of Edessa, the weakest of the four Crusader states. Edessa was not very well protected and did not receive much help from the other three Crusader states. The result was that Ahmed ad-Din pretty easily conquered the city and eliminated the state of Edessa itself. Before he could continue to expand his empire, however, he was assassinated by a prisoner he had taken in 1146, and the small empire he founded was in trouble. The lands that Ahmed ad-Din Zengi ruled were divided among his sons. Mosul, Aleppo, and Edessa were again now disunited. One of his sons, Nur ad-Din Zengi, was given control of Aleppo, and he quickly rose to become the most powerful and influential of the Zengi brothers. His weak brother in Mosul eventually accepted Nur ad-Din's control over the city, reuniting most of the land that his father had controlled. Nur ad-Din now dreamed of doing what his father could not do, 
reunite all of the Muslims of Syria under just one ruler. Damascus, the largest and most important city of the region, still held out against rule by the Zengi family. The governor of Damascus even formed an alliance with the crusader king of Jerusalem to fight against Zengi. Nuruddin did not wish to cause needless bloodshed among Muslims while the crusader state still existed, so he refrained from attacking Damascus. Eventually, however, the governor of Damascus died, and the people of Damascus insisted on Zengi taking control of the city. They were sick of the governor of Damascus allying with the crusaders and giving them weapons and money and gold. So now, by 1154, Nuruddin Zengi was in control of almost all of Syria. He was a serious threat to the crusader kingdoms. The next development in the unity of the Muslims was one that no one really expected to happen. Remember that Fatimid Empire in Egypt? They were on the decline, and Shawar, their Grand Vizier, had recently been overthrown by other forces in the government. So he sent a proposal to Nuruddin Zengi, asking him to help him regain his throne in Egypt and to help fight against the Crusaders. Zengi agreed, and in 1163, he sent an army under the control of a Kurdish general named Shirku in the name of Islamic unity and working together against the Crusaders. And they agreed that after they defeated the Crusaders, the army of Nuruddin would stay in Egypt as a buffer between the Fatimids and the Crusaders. In any case, they defeated the Crusader invasion of Egypt pretty easily and saved the Fatimids. But remember that condition that Zengi's army be allowed to stay in Egypt? The Fatimid vizier didn't really like this. After all, the Fatimids based their existence on destroying the Sunni political world and establishing a Shia caliphate. And now you have a Sunni army in Egypt for the first time in centuries. So the Fatimids actually changed their mind right after defeating the Crusaders. They kicked out Nuruddin Zengi's army and called on the Crusaders and actually offered an alliance with them against the Zengi. Now the Syrian army under Shirku had to leave and retreat to Syria, having been basically backstabbed by the Fatimids. Eventually, however, the Crusaders invaded Egypt again in 1168, and again, the Fatimids asked for help from Zengi, who, again, sent an army. This time, he made it clear he wasn't going to be tricked again. After defeating the Crusaders, General Shirku overthrew the Fatimids and had the untrustworthy Shawar executed. Shirku wouldn't remain in power for very long, however. He would die two months later, and control of Egypt passed to his nephew, a young man by the name of Yusuf. He's better known by his nickname, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Now Salah al-Din was in charge of Egypt, and his boss, Nur al-Din Zengi, was in charge of Syria. And the Crusaders were surrounded by a united Muslim empire for the first time. In the coming episodes, we're going to look at how Salah al-Din is able to use this united Muslim empire to finally liberate the holy city of Jerusalem. So join us next time as we conclude our series on the Crusades. As a reminder, make sure to subscribe to Lost Islamic History on YouTube to get the latest podcast episodes right away, and visit us at lostislamichistory.com. <laughs>